Unique people leading unique lives shape and inform Iowa City. This community is enhanced by these women and men who live in our midst, working, teaching, creating. Welcome to a series of conversations with people who have stories to tell. Join my guests and me, Ellen Buchanan, in a series of interviews called One of a Kind. Jean Lloyd-Jones has been part of our community for the past 46 years. A loyal and active member of the local League of Women Voters, Jean served four years as president of the State League of Women Voters. Politics on various levels has been an important part of her story. Jean was elected to the Iowa House of Representatives and served eight years. Following her time in the House, she ran for the Iowa Senate won and served again eight years. During her time in state government, she established the Iowa Peace Institute in Grinnell, Iowa, and was instrumental in preserving the former Rock Island Railroad. Besides her work in government and the League, she supports and contributes to the UN Association, the Community Theater, Riverside Theater. She served in the vestry of her church on the Council for the Girl Scouts, the Library Board, and was chairman of the Parent Co-op Preschool. Her numerous awards include the Global Cedar Rapids Award for establishing the Peace Institute, the Garst Award presented by the UN for her efforts with the Peace Institute. She was an ICANN Legislator of the Year, and she won an award from the Iowa Pediatric Association for her work with the Buckle Up Baby program. In addition to her local and statewide interests, Jean has traveled the world. She's gone seven times to Russia, to China, Japan, and many other places. She's graduated from Northwestern University with a BA in English and earned a master's in history from the University of Iowa. In 1996, she received a master's from Antioch University in conflict resolution. Jean and her husband have four children, Richard, Mary, John, and Jeffrey, and two grandchildren. Welcome to One of a Kind. Thank you very much, Ellen. Jean, I know your story begins. In 1931, you were born in Washington, D.C., but you really grew up in New Mexico. What took you out there? And tell me about your first family. My father was a lawyer, and I was born in Washington because he was attending law school there at the time. nine days to cross the country mm -hmm. because there were no paved roads west of Kansas City and because uh, every time it was time for me to eat, they stopped the car, drained the radiator, heated my bottle, and then uh, <laughs> <laughs> proceeded. <laughs> so oh, that's great. Oh. And so you lived there, you went through high school in, in um, We Mexico? lived in Carrizozo in a small town until I was a junior in high school. Mm -hmm. And then we moved to Albuquerque because my dad was the only lawyer in Lincoln County. And he said by that time he knew everybody. He couldn't walk down the street without seeing somebody that he had either defended or uh, prosecuted in a lawsuit, and he just knew too much about everyone. Now, he was in politics also? He was, actually. He was a member of the New Mexico legislature um, before he was married. Yeah, uh -huh. 1924 to 27, I think, he was in the, in the New Mexico legislature. So did you talk politics we around the table? We did not. We you did not talk politics. In fact, I didn't even know he'd been in the legislature until I was off at college, I think. Yeah. Huh. And they're still living? My parents are still living. They're to Northwestern University. Were you political in college? No, I wasn't. Uh, I went to the University of New Mexico for three years before I transferred to Northwestern. 
and uh, that's where I met my husband. Jix uh, came down, he was from Mason City, mm -hmm. and he came to Albuquerque to go to school oh. because he had just gotten out of the Army and he had a lung uh, condition that his doctors thought would be improved if he spent some time in, uh, in a dry climate. Mm -hmm. He was the politician. He came in as a veteran and uh, that was the year that the veterans all came to school on the GI Bill. And they just took over university politics, uh, mm -hmm. rewrote the, the uh, student code and, and everything. And I was so impressed at this politician. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I sometimes say he is really the politician in the family. Now, is it true, somebody told me that you saw, heard him read poetry at a reading? Is that how you two met? No, we met because um, I took a pledge daughter to sign up for an activity at the, at the school magazine. Mm -hmm. And Jix was in the office. He was the associate editor of the Thunderbird, which was the New Mexico literary magazine. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we signed my pledge daughter up. And then as we turned to go, he said, um, well, what about you? Don't you want to sign up too? And so I did. And then, of course, I found that I was spending more time at the Thunderbird mm -hmm. office than, <laughs> than she was. <laughs> and uh, he, I found out that he read poetry beautifully, and, and that's how it all started. Mm -hmm. So you were, after college, married? Oh, yes. Uh, we were married in 1951 mm -hmm. and went to England, Scotland, and Wales on our honeymoon which my father was sure was a terrible way to start out a marriage. It was sure not to last. <laughs> Why? Because <laughs> right you were so far away and you oh, were... Oh, because travel is such hard work and, and uh, you know, it's not the best way to get to know each other and so forth. But it was a very good way to get to know each other. We rode bicycles all through Wales and mm. we, it was 1951 was the Festival of Britain. And every town and hamlet had uh, either written an original play or concert or uh, composition of some kind, and we went to the theater every night mm. in London, and it was so cheap, you know. And they were still on rationing then, and we just a uh, couple of kids from from the states were mm -hmm. we were quite um, taken in by especially by the people in Wales who had had American servicemen during the war and felt very kindly towards uh, young Americans. So Sounds like it a was wonderful a, honeymoon. It was a wonderful honeymoon. <laughs> How did you get that? What brought you to Iowa City? Uh, Jix was uh, working on his PhD here in the English department and um, we thought he'd be done in another year so I figured that we would live in this terrible cold climate for one year and then we would go some <laughs> nice warm <laughs> place where uh, that I would like, mm -hmm. like maybe back to the southwest. But that was not to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, 46 he, years later. That's right. Here you are. And it's turned out to be a wonderful place to live and to uh, rear children and just I'm, I couldn't be happier that this is where we've stayed. Now how did you get involved in the league that was quite, uh, it, it shaped you, did it not, and kind of pushed you into politics? The League of Women Voters had a great deal to do with my, uh, my education. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a, a woman, I, my first uh, year in Iowa City, I worked as a secretary in the art department. And the woman who had preceded me in that position was named Betty Fife. Betty was a member of the League of Women Voters, and um, she was the bulletin um, folder and mailer. <laughs> <laughs> and so she invited me to come and help her fold and mail. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, uh, I think by that time, she had uh, one or two children, and I had maybe one. And we would have, the kids would be crawling around on the floor out at this farmhouse where she lived. And, and we would, so I just gradually got into it and then started attending some of the meetings, and um, it was a wonderful outlet for um, a, a young mother at that mm -hmm. time, because in those days, you know, women really didn't work after they had children. It was expected that, unless you were in really dire straits, that you stayed um, home, you stayed home mm -hmm. and took care of the kids. And you see, we had four before it was, uh, before we called it quits on mm -hmm. that. and. Um, it was a way that I could uh, meet adults and have stimulating adult conversation. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, so it was just a really a, a lifesaver for me um, during those days. And then you ended up uh, being president of the State League of Women Voters. First I was president of the Iowa City mm -hmm. uh, League, which I think at that, by that time we had already 
changed the name to Johnson County League, and so I was attending national conventions and, and um, getting out and about, and then I was elected um, the state president. Mm -hmm. So tell me, when you first started out in politics, after your, your kids maybe were probably in high school? All when of you my started? children were out of uh, high school except the last one. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey was still uh, in high school. Mm -hmm. You were a registered Republican. I was. Now there must be a story because you became a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Um, I changed my uh, registration, you know, which is so easy to do here in Iowa, uh, because I wanted to vote for a certain person in a national primary. And in order to vote in a primary, you have to be in that party. You can't just, you know, willy-nilly go mm -hmm. in and vote for whoever you want. Um, so I changed my registration and just left it there because I realized that I was philosophically more of a Democrat than I was a Republican. Okay. Now, when you started out um, in the House, when you were elected to the House, how many women were in the House when you first went? Well, it was 1979, and um, my recollection is there were about 11 of us. There were only three Democratic women. I was one of three, and I was the only new one. Okay, looking back on those eight years in the in the house, what were some of the your biggest challenges those years? What were you dealing with? What was on the minds of the state voters? Well, um, first I should tell you that the, my first um, day when I walked in to take my seat in the House of Representatives, um, the first question that anyone asked me was, "Whose secretary are you?" Oh. And that was a a very big shock to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, the um, what did you say? Well, I said I'm Representative Lloyd Jones, and they were more embarrassed than I was, of course, mm -hmm. at that. Uh, <laughs> but the stories go on. I mean, you'll hear any whim any woman will tell you, uh, you know, equally bad stories um, of how women are. I mean, it's just assumed that the men were the legislators and the women were the the clerks. Did you see it shifting by the time you spent eight years in the Senate? Definitely. Mm -hmm. So, what were some of the issues you were uh, you you were? Well, one of the first with. issues that uh, that I got involved in was historic preservation, mm -hmm. and I had a very um, a bad experience uh, with that because I had a, an amendment to the historic preservation bill that had something to do with how many members of the planning and zoning committee could be on in historic preservation, and uh, for some reason the um, the Republicans who were in charge of things then did not want a Democratic amendment to pass. And so they persuaded me to withdraw my amendment because they said it's holding up the whole historic preservation bill and if you don't withdraw your amendment, you, you know, you're, you're not going to take it up. Mm -hmm. So it'll be your fault. <laughs> <laughs> so I pondered that for a little while and consulted some of my leaders and they said, well, you better withdraw it. So I did. And I immediately had a headache. This is when I realized that I have tremendous biofeedback, mm -hmm. reliable bi biofeedback. I had a terrible headache that lasted for three days. And finally, I said to myself, I woke up in the middle of the night one night, and I said, <laughs> you've got to be kidding me. They're not <laughs> holding this up for this little bitty amendment. So I went back, and I um, found out how you do these things. You say, I have more information, and I want to put this amendment back on. Um, so the end of the story is that uh, my it amendment passed, and the, and the bill passed, and uh, you know, and your headache was gone. And my headache was gone. <laughs> um, no, it was a it was a really good lesson sure. how not to be sucked in by mm -hmm. this. Uh, you know, these these important people come to you and say things, and you just have to say, <laughs> forget it. your heart and your mind. Yes, yes. and yes. your body <laughs> and your body. Yes, that's a, lucky you have that biofeedback. Yeah. So, what were some of the things you really feel good about? 
in this world? Well, in the House, I, I really think that uh, maybe the, the best contribution that I made to in my entire career was um, Um, all your life, or is this was this recent? When, once you went to Des Moines? No, no, no. no. I, I loved trains when I was a little girl. You know, they would come steam. The steam engines would come through this little town of Carrizozo, where I lived. And uh, it's I a wonderful to, name, Carrizozo. Yes, it's an Indian name. Hmm. It means dry, dry grass or something like so that. So the steam engine went past the dry grass. Yes, and and started fires actually. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I just always liked trains. I always loved to travel on the train. When I was a child, we we traveled to see my grandparents on the trains, and you know, mm -hmm. it was just I just always thought it was a wonderful way to travel. And um, but when I got in the legislature, the Rock Island Railroad was in bankruptcy, and uh, they were going to auction it off or sell it off to the highest bidder. But they didn't have a bidder for the entire uh, system. So they were going to just sell off little bitty pieces of it. Well, you know when you sell off little pieces, you'll never get it put back together. Mm -hmm. So I kept thinking there must be a way, there must be a way. And um, I, we were in the minority, you know, my party was in the minority. So what we did, um, I got permission to hold some uh, hearings around the state on railroads. Mm -hmm. And I was the co-chair, I was the House chairperson and there was a Senate chairperson. Uh, we had Neil Goldschmidt, who was the National Transportation Secretary, um, newly appointed, to come and um, uh, kick off our, our series. And we went around the state and held these meetings and got information about exactly how important were railroads to shippers of various uh, kinds. Mm -hmm. And built our case and began um, slowly. It, this literally took six years to get the final piece before um, it was able to be sold and, uh, and is now a profitable railroad. Uh, it's one of the largest regional railroads in the country. And uh, so I'm very yes. proud of that. I, I just really, and of course, uh, one person doesn't do this by herself. Uh, however, I know that had I not just stuck it stuck to it like mm -hmm. a leech, you know, <laughs> doggedly. <laughs> right. Because there were many, many times that people said, oh, forget it, that's not going to pass, mm -hmm. you know, nobody wants it. None of mm -hmm. the leadership wanted it. <laughs> you know? Just go away, really. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, it was just one of those things I just felt, I just felt, you know, had to be done. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, certainly you should feel good about the Peace Institute. I do. I feel very good about the Peace Institute. And that happened at a time when um, uh, we were in the midst of the Cold War with the mm -hmm. Soviet Union. We had missiles pointed at each other and uh, it, was, it was a very frightening and, and um, bleak time, I think, for international relations. And um, I just got thinking, you know, what, uh, what can we do? We have so much here in Iowa. We have people who are, who have um, exchange students all the time. We mm -hmm. have people who really uh, are dependent upon world peace. I mean, the farmer, <laughs> the farmers have to have markets, you know. I mean, we, we just can't be isolationist here in Iowa. And so I began talking to, with some people about what can we do that would be a positive thing. Mm -hmm. Rather than just, you know, at that time the peace groups were all saying uh, ban the bomb and zero this and that. Mm -hmm. and it was all negative. I said, let's see what positive, constructive things we could do here in Iowa. And uh, a wonderful group of people came together. Former, go uh, former Governor Ray, Mary Louise Smith, Mary Jane O'Dell, uh, Bob Anderson, just, just some wonderful people. And, um, and put together a peace institute that is, as you pointed out, it's, it's uh, located in Grinnell. Mm -hmm. The current president is, or chair of the board is uh, George Drake, who was former president of Grinnell College. Its mission has changed somewhat because after we got started and had a lot of international exchanges, uh, see, we believed in citizen diplomacy. We believed that we needed to see the Russians and they needed to see us. Mm -hmm. Um, because the governments were just making a mess of things. 
And so um, that's why I had uh, seven trips to the Soviet Union. I, I went uh, to things called the International Peace Dialogue. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and things will never be the same again. You see, they've been brainwashed. Mm -hmm. We'd been brainwashed mm -hmm. about them. They'd been brainwashed about us. But they thought that all Americans were lazy and, uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that we um, hired, pe hired our work done, uh, that we had a very stratified class system. It just blew their minds, mm. you know, to find out that we actually, uh, my husband actually, um, um, grilled the hamburgers mm -hmm. on the 4th of July and didn't hire somebody to do it mm -hmm. and that I actually did our laundry in the in the machine you know mm -hmm. they were just they had no idea how we lived um, anyway I think that not just what the Peace Institute was doing but what a lot of other groups were doing at the same time really helped uh, open the eyes of, of people on both sides um, are you optimistic about its future or uh, the Peace Institute yes the Peace Institute, yes, I am optimistic. Its mission has changed mm -hmm. because when, when the Berlin Wall came down and when peace broke out, there were people who said, well, we don't need the Peace Institute mm -hmm. now, do we? And my feeling was we need it more than ever mm -hmm. because <laughs> now we have to learn how to live with each other uh, because there are going to be a lot of different, and you see what's happened. I mean, mm -hmm. the, every- We have to learn to negotiate. We do. We have to learn. That's why I went back to school and got conflict resolution uh, training because that's what it is. It's negotiation mm -hmm. and uh, making making clear what your interests are and what my interests are and seeing where they overlap and see what we can do because you, no longer can this world survive with um, uh, just doing away with the enemy. <laughs> I mean, and this just doesn't work. Jean, uh, we've got so much to cover, but tell me looking back on your life of uh, politics and uh, the League and um, just growing up in New Mexico, who's had a major influence on you? Well, I knew you were going to ask that question, Ellen, and uh, it is really difficult to say. Mm -hmm. um, of course, my parents had a tremendous influence on me. Uh, my mother started a little scrapbook for me when I was very, very young, before I went to school. With, called Dolls of Other Lands, and she had um, an international uh, pictures of, of dolls from other countries. And I think from very, very early on, I knew that there was a great big world out here mm -hmm. with children in it, you know, mm -hmm. just like me, um, only different. And, that, and this whole idea of being tolerant and learning how to live with other people on the planet, I think probably started way back then. Mm -hmm. um, my husband, of course, had a tremendous <laughs> influence on me because he treated me like a grown-up, even though I certainly wasn't grown-up <laughs> when we were married. Um, I would probably have followed the pattern that my family did, mm -hmm. which was um, daddy handing out the um, grocery money and mother then, you know, carefully taking her. Jix would have none of that. I mean, you know, we're going to have a joint bank account, and it was my responsibility <laughs> to figure out what we needed, you know, mm -hmm. what I needed to do to run the house and so on. Um, he never would make a decision for me. Mm -hmm. Never. I would ask, you know, things like, gee, should I run for the legislature? He, he managed very, <laughs> very easily. He avoided that. He would uh -huh. talk about it. Mm -hmm. He would say, I have no doubt you can if you want to, you know, it's things up to like you, that. Jean. It's up to you, <laughs> and I finally uh -huh. learned to stand on my own feet and not go to him for um, advice mm -hmm. or, uh, well, no, for advice, yes, but not for, for decisions. decisions. Yeah. Smart man. He is a smart man. <laughs> He's a wonderful man. <laughs> now, when I called one of your colleagues, I said, uh, tell me a little bit about Jean personally, and she, she said, was Manette. She said, she's got a wonderful sense of humor. And then she sent me this article that was in the Des Moines Register with a cartoon by Duffy of Jean Lloyd-Jones and Manette Doderer and the bartender is saying,
regular legislative meetings with constituents. We mm -hmm. had a group come to us and say, if you're really concerned about drunk driving, what you should do is stop people from buying a cold beer at the filling station mm -hmm. and then driving off with it. And so Manette said, uh, oh, we can do that, you know. <laughs> 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 and um, we went back, and on Monday or Tuesday, I was chair of the state government committee in the House, and Manette was a member of the mm -hmm. committee, and we had, I think, nine women on this committee. It was a great <laughs> committee. <laughs> and there was a bill that was um, to which this amendment would be germane. Mm -hmm. So Manette moved it. We discussed it a little bit and passed it. It made perfect sense to us. I saw in the back of the room where the lobbyists sit, I saw the lobby for the beer distributors get up and walk out the door. Mm -hmm. And what he did was go right around to Don Avinson's office, who was Speaker of the House, and he said, you'll never guess what those women have done to the Senate, <laughs> let's see, the Senate picnic. The Senate picnic was, was ruined because we had outlawed cold beer. Well, ah. of course, we hadn't outlawed no. cold beer at all. But um, anyway, it, it never had, <laughs> it never got any serious discussion. I mean, it was immediately made uh, a, a, a joke. Well, Flansburg said there was something in the Iowa City water that the two of you were drinking. Oh, yeah, they had all kinds. I bet they got, had fun with that. But I want to tell you, this got all at play. At the very same meeting, we passed a resolution establishing the Iowa Peace Institute. Oh, well. That and got it got a buried, little it? bitty notice yeah. with no names attached or anything. Isn't that interesting? It is. Yeah. Um, I'd like to ask you, now that you are retired, but you're not. I know you've got your <laughs> involvement in many things. But you have a wonderful avocation of m building and making these miniatures. Now I find out your mother gave you this dollhouse. Yes. It must come from that. Uh, explain to our viewers what you're, what you're doing with these. Well, um, I got interested. Actually, when I was still in the legislature, I, I um, started making a dollhouse for my granddaughter, uh, ostensibly for my granddaughter, and then I realized immediately that it was not for her, it was for me. Mm -hmm. uh, but I got into, you know, creating this, um, this whole environment, this um, house, which is 1790 Yorktown, Virginia. Had to do some research for it and um, began making the, you know, putting the floor and the wallpaper and all that, and then making the rugs and the dolls and so on. And it's, uh, it's just a way to create a little world. Is it therapy, too? It's therapy. It's absolutely it's therapy. Um, and then when I had that one more or less finished, mm -hmm. I realized, um, actually my daughter and granddaughter suggested this, because we had gone to Santa Fe for Christmas one year, they suggested I make an adobe dollhouse for my next project. So um, my immediate reaction was, oh, no, that's much too hard. And then 10 minutes later, I was thinking, hmm, wonder how you do it, you know? <laughs> Baking bricks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Miniature bricks. So we had a friend from Santa Fe who sent me uh, 20 pounds of, of uh, adobe dirt. And that was the beginning. And I made little molds and made little tiny bricks and began hmm. building. thinking it might be a Japanese house mm -hmm. because I'm really uh, crazy about the architecture of the Japanese country house, mm -hmm. which I think could be great fun to do. My last question is, you have four children. Just tell me uh, quickly where they are living. The oldest lives in, on a boat in, uh, in Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one is uh, my daughter. I have three boys and one girl. Mm -hmm. Uh, the daughter uh, lives in Minneapolis and uh, works for H&R Block now. Uh, the third one lives in Vancouver, Washington, and uh, works for a uh, telephone company um, acquiring new companies. And the fourth one is a dental anthropologist, and he's living in Hawaii. <laughs> oh you have some wonderful places to visit, don't you? Yes, we do. Now that you're retired. Yes, we yes. do. Yes, but, but Iowa City will always be your home base. Oh, absolutely. We have decided we are not leaving Iowa City. This is a wonderful place to retire.
could. Well, mm -hmm. on that note, we, I will thank you for being my guest on One of a Kind. Thank you. My guest on One of a Kind has been Jean Lloyd-Jones. Her many interests include politics, the Iowa Peace Institute, American foreign policy, conflict resolution, preservation of the former Rock Island Railroad, and foreign travel. Jean has received awards and honors for her work with the Peace Institute, her legislative activities, and other community involvements. Friends and colleagues describe Jean as a woman who is caring, bright, possessing a wonderful sense of humor, and who has the ability to handle adversity and move on. Politician, activist, community leader, wife, mother, grandmother, and craftswoman, Jean Lloyd-Jones is one of a kind. <laughs>